Hello, very good evening, and thank you, Dr. Nadeem. This is where we begin a series of lectures on cervical cytopathology. In this one, I shall be providing you with a brief outline of the Bethista system of cervical cytopathology reporting, along with a discussion of some of the issues related to smear adequacy. This will be followed by the following lectures over the coming weeks and months. The three fundamental guiding principles of the Bethista systems are as follows. The first of which is clear communication of clinically relevant information from laboratory to healthcare providers using a uniform and reproducible terminology which is at the same time flexible and adaptable to a variety of laboratory settings and conditions. And also the terminology should reflect current understanding of biology of cervical neoplasia. This is very well demonstrated on the timeline. Since its inception in 1988, it has been a process in evolution marked by these three workshops in 1988, 1991, 2001 and the 2014 Bethista system update. In between, there has been the publication of these three atlases, edition 1, edition 2, and finally, not exactly finally, but the current edition is edition 3, which was uh, published in 2015. Here we see a bird's eye view of the Bethista system. Now, what is written over here, most of it is uh, in too small a font for you to read and I do not expect you to read this stuff but I would definitely like to draw your attention to the items which have been shown over here in red. These are the seven major headings in which we need to look at the Bethesda system. The, these divisions are specimen type specimen adequacy, a general categorization, interpretation slash results, use of adjunctive tests, computer assisted interpretation of cervical cytopathology and educational notes. As you can see over here, they have been put in different color codes. The ones in red are the ones which are mandatory in your reporting using this system. The ones in yellow are optional. So you need to comment on the type of the specimen, whether you're reporting on a conventional pap smear or in one of, of the liquid-based cytology preparations like thin prep or sure path. You need to comment on specimen adequacy. As far as the general categorization is concerned, this is something which is optional because once you use this section of interpretation slash results, this particular categorization becomes more or less redundant. However, it can be extremely useful in grouping your cases in the three major categories, as you can see over here, which can come in very handy if your system is integrated to some laboratory information system or you are trying to put together the record and trying to use them for statistical analysis later for some study. Adjunctive testing, of course, if you are using some adjunctive tests, for example, HPV testing, computer-assisted interpretation of cervical cytopathology only in those labs which use computer vision or computer-assisted techniques to screen mostly or maybe report, but I think it can be used for screening. So if you're using that, you have to mention that you are using a computer assisted interpretation. And then of course, the educational notes in which you may like to put a comment as to further management of the patient. But this can be a tricky issue because sometimes the clinicians, they do not like the cytopathologists to mention that because they say that they are the ones who are going to decide. But if you have a set protocol of clinical management, which is prevalent in the practice of the place where you're practicing, you might like to add that, but you should have a clear communication with the clinician as far as this point is concerned. 
Coming to the subject of adequacy of cervical smears, the key points which determine smear adequacy and related issues are as follows. You need to assess the cellularity of the squamous cells and there is a minimum cellularity criteria as we are going to elaborate in the next few slides. You have to look for the presence of endocervical cells slash metaplastic cells which are representative of the transformation zone. You have to note or look for presence of obscuring and interfering factors which prevents you from giving a proper evaluation of the squamous cell component. And you also need to keep in mind factors like slide labels, patient identification, broken slides, all these things are determinants which help you determine the adequacy of the smear. So this is a kind of approach, a kind of an algorithm if you can say, which I have put together. So the, what are the key factors? They are shown over here in blue. So you have to make sure that the patient and the slides are properly identified, whether the slide is intact and the label is properly visible. And then comes the stuff which you look in your micro, through microscopy. So you have to assess the number of squamous cells, the presence of representative elements from the transformation zone, the, and the percentage of squamous cells which are not properly evaluable due to obscuring elements or evaluable, right? So these are the five major factors which you take into account. Depending on what you find here, the remaining part of the algorithm is going to go through. So if one of these things shown in orange is there, it means that the slide immediately becomes unsatisfactory. What do you mean by that? So if, of course, the patient and the slide identification is missing, or there is a missing label, or there is a broken slide, you cannot evaluate the slide under the microscope, it immediately becomes unsatisfactory. However, if this, everything is, the first two points are okay, then you are able to assess the slide. And then if you find that the number of squamous cells are insufficient, and we are going to talk about those numbers a little bit later, or 75% or more of the squamous cells are obscured by some obscuring elements, the smear immediately becomes unsatisfactory. However, on the right side of the screen, you have got the stuff which move on into making a smear satisfactory. So first of all, the patient and the slide identification should be proper. The slide should have a proper label. The slide should be unbroken, that is properly evaluable. There are sufficient number of squamous cells and there is obscuring of less than 75% of the squamous cells. If all these criteria are fulfilled, then the smear is satisfactory. But that is not exactly the end of the story because there are a few other quality indicators as a result of which this particular branch of the tree has got two further sub-branches. If the transformation zone component is present in sufficient numbers and if the obscuring is less than 50% of the squamous cells, this becomes a plain satisfactory smear, right? However, if the transformation zone component is absent and the obscuring is between 50 to 75 percent of the squamous cells, it is still a satisfactory smear, but you have to use some additional comments on these quality indicators. Most importantly, you have to remember that if there is any smear with epithelial abnormality, or it may be a non-epithelial abnormality that you suspect for example, a lymphoma or a sarcoma. So anything of that sort, the slide should be immediately categorized as adequate, or satisfactory for evaluation. So the under specimen adequacy, these are the two major categories. A slide can be satisfactory for evaluation or unsatisfactory for evaluation. And the facts which lead up to this category of satisfactory for evaluation I have already discussed in the previous slide. As far as unsatisfactory for evaluation is concerned, if you make that report, if you report something as unsatisfactory, you have to state the reason. An unsatisfactory sample can be because of the fact that the specimen has been rejected, for example, for a lack of a label or broken slide, wrong patient identification, etc., or 
these factors are pretty good. They are okay. However, when you evaluate the slide, you find some facts which I have discussed in the previous slide. Some factors like lack of adequate squamous cellularity, obscuring factors greater than 75%. When that happens, it becomes unsatisfactory for evaluation in a fully evaluated slide. So these two are technically, at least from the angle of nomenclature, semantics, a little bit different. But whatever it is, you have to cite a reason. However, there are a few other important additional points which you should remember. The presence of any abnormal epithelial cell make a smear satisfactory, which I have already mentioned. And if you find the presence of some organisms or benign endometrial cells in women above the age of 45 years, the smear is unsatisfactory, but in the comments you have to mention these facts because these will help the clinician with further management plans. So what about the cellularity? Now as far as the cellularity is, is concerned, it is to do with the cellularity of squamous cells. So in liquid based cytology preparation, there should be at least 5000 well visualized and well preserved squamous cells or even squamous metaplastic cells, but you have to exclude ECC and obscured cells. So this is what the cellularity criteria is all about. In case of conventional smears, it should be at least 8,000. Bethesda states 8,000 to 12,000. I really am not a fan of using a range when you are quoting a minimum count. So I would say that it is better to stick to a figure of either 8,000 or 12,000. I hardly see conventional smears nowadays, but I guess 8,000 is a pretty good number to stick to rather than talking about a range of 8,000 to 12,000. However, there are certain situations where you might like to relax the criteria and there is scope for you to relax in, for relaxing the criteria. For example, if the patient has prior radiotherapy, chemotherapy, hysterectomy or a menopausal patient, you may bring down the threshold to a minimum count of 2000. So you can relax it down to 2000, but not lower than that. So these are the situations where you can do so. Now, what about counting? In order to count, you really do not have to go and count 5,000 cells on a liquid-based cytology preparation or 8,000 cells in a conventional smear. There are certain guidelines which help give you a kind of a shortcut so which allows you to estimate whether the cellularity is above the cutoff of 5,000. In order to do so, you need to keep in mind the following factors. First of all, you should know the type of smear that you are looking at. So a 13 millimeter is a sure path specimen, 20 millimeter diameter is a thin prep specimen. So you should know what kind of smear you are looking at. And then depending on the objective or the FN number which is located on your eyepiece, FN stands for field number, you will be, you, it, you will be able to find out that what is the minimum number of cells which make you come to a conclusion that the count is above 5000. So let's see, for example, I like to use the 40x objective for my assessment. So when I use a 40x objective, because my on my microscope, the field number is FN22 is on, on the eyepiece. So we have a field FN22 eyepiece with the 40x objective using a thin prep, which is a 20 millimeter diameter smear, the number of cells which I need to have in each of these or on an average on the 40x objective is 3.8. So it's roughly say around four. So if I see four cells or more on a 40x objective, I know that the number of cells are above 5,000, right? So this table is from this particular atlas. Now, in situations where you are not, you are not using a 10x or a 40x objective, or the field number is something other than 20 or 22, you can use this formula over here to find out the number of cells, number of squamous cells rather, necessary in these fields. 
in order to get a count of 5000. So how do you count? In order to count, you have to count a minimum of 10 fields across the diameter. This automatically includes the center and then you average it out. So for example, if you make a count of 10 fields and uh, on say a 40x objective and you find 50 square mass cells, so it is 50 divided by 10, 5, so that's above 4, so it means that your cellularity is pretty okay. But at the same time, you should also take into account, this is a kind of a common sense approach to see the amount of empty areas that are present in the slide and you have to take that into consideration before assessing the cellularity, which means, for example, if you are doing a count and you find that your count going through the center of the slide is above your cutoff point, but you see there are large empty spaces in this slide, then you have to take that into account before commenting on the adequacy of the smear. Now, this is a thin prep smear. So these are like 10 fields. Now these fields can be at 40x, it can be at 20x, it can be at 10x, but the approach is basically the same. You go right through the center, you will always include the center and you have to count a minimum of 10 fields. Take the total, divide it by 10 and you will get your count and see if that count is above your cutoff point or not. Right. So the good news is that in the vast majority of cases, it is not necessary to count. Eyeballing is good enough in making a correct assessment. It is only necessary to count cases with the so-called borderline cellularity on eyeballing that you are not really very sure. And I'm going to show this to you with, the, with one of the slides. For example, if you look at this particular picture, the one to the left, this one has got enough cells, and this you of course gather by a little bit of experience, to say that there are enough squamous cells over here to easily be above a 5,000 count. Maybe it is like an 8, 10,000 count smear. So there is no need to count. Just by eyeballing, you can say that this is adequate. If you look at the smear to your right, you will see here there are hardly any squamous cells. Maybe like around 4, 5, 6 squamous cells lying over here. So there is no need to do a count over here because you just by looking at the smear, you know that this is going to be an inadequate smear. However, this smear over here is possibly a place where there are some empty spaces, a few squamous cell here and there. It may be above 5,000, may not be above 5,000. So this smear over here would be something which is the so-called borderline cellularity category, in which case you need to do the counts in the ways that has been described in the previous slides. Right. Now, one more thing to remember, sometimes a smear can show very poor cellularity, just a few squamous cells here and there, and this is one of such examples. Now, in these cases, you have to be extremely careful in screening the slide properly. For example, in this case, there are very few squamous cells, looks like an unsatisfactory smear, the count is nowhere near 5000, but then in the middle of this field, you have got this little cluster of around five or four or five cells, and these are malignant cells. So this is from a case of a squamous cell carcinoma. There's a little bit, a significant amount of background diathesis. So this is a key message. If you see a smear, which looks inadequate, just don't be in a hurry to just remove it from the, from, from the, slide, from the, from the microscope stage. Please screen that smear very carefully because these are the smears where there could be malignant cells and you are going to make a very big mistake if you don't screen them properly. You're going to miss out on malignancy, so be very careful. Now, what about repeating the preparation in cases of unsatisfactory smears? Is there a rule? Yes, there is. If the smear shows low squamous cellularity and by looking at it, you feel that it could be because of some technical shortfall, it might be a good idea to repeat the preparation. Because many, quite often, the repeat preparation may show adequate cellularity. Now, to be considered a satisfactory smear, the repeat preparation, the number of squamous shells should be above the threshold over there. And you cannot do summing up. So, for example, if you your first smear has a cellularity which is, say, roughly around, say, 3,500, the second smear has a cellularity of... 4,000, so together it is 7,500, you think, okay, that's fine, I've got more than 5,000 cells, so I can call this smear adequate. No, you can't, because 
you have to assess every smear individually. So the second smear by itself should have a count of more than 5,000. Right. The next important factor that we look at, the presence of endocervical cells slash metaplastic cells, which represent the so-called transformation zone, extremely important because this is where, from where the cervical cancers originate. So, Remember, it is not an adequacy determinant, as I have already mentioned before, but it is more of a quality indicator, right? But it is reported in the adequacy section, depending on what you have. Now, an adequate representation of the ECC slash transformation zone has a cutoff of at least 10 well-preserved endocervical or metaplastic cells. The count is important. It is not necessary to have them in clusters so they may be present individually or in clusters make sure that you do not count the parabasal cells or other degenerated cells stuck in mucus and call them endocervical no that doesn't happen okay you can't do that and sometimes you may have a difficulty you have some kind of difficulty in differentiating between parabasal and metaplastic cells when you cannot say for sure so you please mention that in your comment that i am seeing some cells which i'm not very sure whether if they are parabasal or metaplastic cells. Right, so the transformation zone component, these are some views of endocervical cells, and you are going to see a lot more of this in the lecture on glandular lesions. These are benign endocervical cells, and these are some examples of metaplastic cells, which can again have a wide range of appearances, especially when they show some kind of reparative and reactive changes. These are these cells, uh, these are the metaplastic cells. As you can see over here with angulated outlines, no problem over here. Right. However, here, this usually happen in situations with atrophic smears, right? So here what you have are some cells, which we are not very sure whether they are really metaplastic or whether they are parabasal. So you're not really very sure. Some people might say, okay, these look just like endocervicals. If you have these situations, most of the time it happens in atrophic smears. You just make a note saying that there are some cells present, but I'm not very sure whether they're metaplastic or parabasal. Of course, if you find some well-preserved endocervical cells somewhere, then there is no problem. It sorts it out. Right. The next factor, obscuring and interfering factors. The major factors which can obscure a smear are inflammatory cells, blood, and lubricants. Now, as I've already mentioned in this slide on the approach, if a smear has greater than 75% of the squamous cells which are obscured, then it is an unsatisfactory smear. Please note, it is 75% of the squamous cells and not 75% of the smear area. If 50 to 75% of the squamous cells are obscured, then, okay, it is still satisfactory, right? It is still satisfactory, but you have to add a note saying that, well, this amount of smear area is obscured by the squamous cells and it is a fact which is to go into your report. So it indicates to the clinician that okay you have made an assessment, the smear is satisfactory but there were some hindrances as far as that is concerned. Now these are some pictures of the obscuring factors. These are inflammatory cells obscuring the squamous cells. These are some amount of lubricant which has come on the smear. Here, there is possibly a bit of lubricant, possibly some RBCs. I couldn't find from our materials some good smears to take pictures where RBCs are obscuring the smear. Most of the time, we use thin prep, and most often than not, it does it pretty. We really do not find too many cases with RBCs obscuring the smear, right? And as far as the interfering and obscuring factors are concerned, a few other things one should keep in mind. Now, as far as the lubricants are concerned, there are water-based lubricants which according to some study do not create a problem, according to other studies they do create a problem. But as far as carbomer-based lubricants are concerned, they almost always create a big adverse effect, especially on thin prep smears. In fact, interestingly, there has been a study which was published in Cyto Journal in 2017 from Sorbet et al. This is, I think, a study from Norway in which they used a kind of a neat, a very neat hack. So their thin prep specimens, when they found it has been contaminated with lubricants, they used the sure path method to reprocess the sample and they found that the obscuring factors went. So if you want, you can just take a look at this particular article. 
What about hemorrhagic specimens? We really do not have, that is not such a big problem, but one of the things which might help in case of hemorrhagic specimen is a glacial acetic acid wash. But you have to remember it has been reported at least in some studies that uh, use of glacial acetic acid may interfere with HPV testing if you are doing that on these particular samples. Now, finally, we've come to a few couple of slides in which I'm going to show you in brief the management guidelines when it comes to unsatisfactory smears and smears with absent or transformation zone component. This is according to the American Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Cytopathology ASCCP guidelines of 2019. So this is absolutely fresh. So what happens in patients with unsatisfactory smears according to these guidelines? If there are no HPV tests or the HPV results are unknown, irrespective of the patient's age or HPV test has been done, the age of the patient is more than 25 years, right? In these two cases, the patient goes for a repeat age-based screening according to the protocols after two to four months. If it is negative, they go back to the routine screening guidelines. If it is abnormal, they go to the guidelines for abnormal screens. However, it is unsatisfactory, and this is the most important thing in this particular slide. So two unsatisfactories, one unsatisfactory here, and the second unsatisfactory patient should go for colposcopy. If the patient is HPV positive in greater than 25 years, you can decide whether or the clinician can decide whether the patient goes back for repeat age-based screening or colposcopy. So this is up to the clinician to decide. However, if it is HPV positive and it is HPV 16 or 18 positive after an unsatisfactory smear, the patient should go for colposcopy. So this is something as far as the management guidelines of unsatisfactory smears are concerned. In brief, just to give you an idea, there is a role of HPV testing and there is of course a role of the so-called the, the age of the patient and other factors. Two unsatisfactory smears goes for colposcopy. This is a very important point to remember. Right, the other important point is if a smear is unsatisfactory and on the same specimen the HPV testing is negative, then that test has to be discounted. You are not going to take that as a negative HPV test if the smear itself is unsatisfactory. Right. Now, what about management of cases with absent ECC and transformation zone? Sometimes you might wonder, what is the point of writing satisfactory and then writing transformation zones absent or whatever? There is a reason behind that because this fits into different parts of the management guidelines. If the patient has a smear with absent transformation zone, and the age of the patient is around 21 to 29 years, so it is below 30 years, the patient goes for routine screening. Things are different if the age of the patient is greater than 30 years, so that's a very important point. If you have absent ECC transformation zone, age of the patient is 30 years, then there are, things are different. If it is greater than 30 years, the patient is HPV negative, goes to routine screening, if the HPV status is unknown, then please put the try and get the patient and get the patient through an HPV test, right? Or you could also decide to repeat the cytology in three years. If it is HPV positive, then you ask for genotyping and or you can ask for an HPV based test in one year and then manage according to the 2019 guidelines. So here you have a number of places where things you can you can take i mean the clinician can decide with the, with the sim with one outcome there can be two different branches into the decision tree so that's about all for this particular lecture thanks for watching and hope to see you soon in the next lecture thank you